Our next speaker, our next presenters rather, will focus on harnessing talent and putting evidence into action. I'd like to invite Dr. Cameron Stockdale to take the mic. Dr. Stockdale is the CEO and president at the Work Wellness Institute. Welcome, Dr. Stockdale. Thank you very much. Uh, first, I'd like to say uh, thank you to Realize for inviting us to uh, speak today. Uh, and I'd like to recognize that I'm coming to you from the traditional territory of the Coast Salish people here in Burnaby, British Columbia. Um, so uh, as, the, as it was introduced, I'm the relatively new CEO of the organization um, and I'm cognizant of the time. Uh, Mark has a lot to speak to you about with research to the research project. So I'll try and get through this uh, fairly quickly. Um, our organization, the Work Wellness Institute was founded in the, the mid eighties. And our vision is to create uh, safe and healthy uh, and inclusive workplaces for all. And as such, our work focuses on projects which embody the ideals of equity, diversity, and inclusion for everyone in the workplace. Um, so we'll, I'll get you to go to the next slide. So I'll talk about the Harnessing Talent Project specifically. The Harnessing Talent Project is a three-year grant, uh, which is funded by the Opportunities Fund uh, under the, the umbrella of ESDC Canada. Um, and the objective of that fund is really um, you know, helping employers better utilize the skills and abilities of all Canadians with, with disabilities. So the project itself has some, I put some key sort of objectives of the, the program there. And that one is to foster communities of practice, uh, you know, helping employers recruit and retain uh, employees with disabilities, um, providing evidence informed solutions. Uh, and Mark will talk a little bit about um, you know, how we've gone about that. We also, one of the things with respect to harnessing talent is that we're looking to become a research hub. So a place, a centralized location where people can come to uh, for research. And we have a research portal that, um, you know, is being launched soon. We're just doing some final testing on that. And one of the last objectives or highlights of the harnessing talent project itself um, is that we want to be able to inform post-secondary institutions and their training programs. Um, so that's an overview, a sort of very high level overview of the Harnessing Talent uh, project. You know, we do all of this work through developing evidence-based tools and resources for employers so that they can implement best practice in their workplace. And as you can see, when I hand this over to Mark, the first step in this is often identifying where the knowledge gaps are. And then our goal is to develop the tools to fill those knowledge gaps. Um, that said, uh, if I may be permitted to uh, plug uh, uh, the Work Wellness Institute a little bit, I would encourage you to go to our website and, and sign up for our free newsletter, which informs people about um, some of our partners and the good work they're doing, like Realize and CCRW. Um, you know, and it will also give you some information about our free webinars that happen uh, and our new programs and courses like our e-curriculum. I believe we have six online in our e-curriculum now with another uh, 12 coming in the next little uh, next couple of months. Uh, and you'll have access to our uh, app, our online app from your cell phone um, and some of our podcasts, etc. So there's a lot of information that's coming out from our organization. Um, and I would encourage you to go there and uh, and sign up for the newsletter where you can access all that. With that, uh, thank you, and I will turn it over to Mark, and he's got lots to talk to you about. Thank you so much, Dr. Stockdale. We uh, certainly appreciate the work that you're doing at the Work Wellness Institute. If anyone has any questions for Dr. Stockdale or our next speaker, please type them in the Q&A window, and we will open the floor in a few minutes. Our next speaker, Dr. Mark White, comes to us from the Department of Family Practice at the University of British Columbia, where he's a clinical assistant professor. Welcome, Dr. White. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm uh, really pleased to be here uh, today and, um, and, and thrilled with the uh, research that's being presented as well. And you'll see that there's some crossover uh, uh, between the research activities. So as Cam mentioned, one of the things that we were looking at is to identify gaps uh, and to get a better understanding uh, in a similar way uh, that was um, in exploring what HR human resource professionals uh, uh, perspectives are around uh, recruitment and uh, retention of people with disabilities. And as part of that, we developed an academic community research partnership team under the uh, Harnishing Talent program. 
And uh, you'll see Maureen is there and uh, uh, Tammy is there, uh, as well as other organizations. And uh, we work together um, as both the researchers and the community partners as uh, equal partners. Next slide, please. Uh, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the Organizational Readiness Project, which was really specifically engaging uh, employers, human resource professionals, uh, to better understand the current practice with organizations with respect to recruitment and retention of people with disabilities, and identify key challenges and potential enablers to support recruitment and retention of people with disabilities. And so we used, uh, we had two different uh, surveys uh, that we utilized. Uh, we created an organizational readiness survey, and this was a survey that we modified from one that was used in the US um, for human resource professionals around uh, recruitment and retention of people with disabilities, as well as we used uh, secondary data from the um, uh, CPHR, the um, Chartered Professionals Human Resources in Alberta, regarding their um, continuing professional development. So the sample was about 1184 in total. Um, if we can go to the next slide, uh, the next section. Now in that section, uh, we asked what their roles and responsibilities were. And um, uh, we found that uh, if we just hit the next part, uh, there's, there's an, there, we'll find that um, human resource professionals take on many roles, uh, have many roles and responsibilities. Uh, employer, employee relations, recruiting uh, were common, uh, training and development as well. Um, uh, but you'll see that uh, the median number of roles was 10 and the average number of roles is 9.4. So uh, we can understand that human uh, resource professionals are very busy uh, in doing a lot of different things within their organization. If we can go to the next slide. So what we learned about HR professionals is they do play a central role in establishing work conditions. Uh, they're interested in expanding skills and competencies to impact their organization's strategic HR and business objectives. And they're interested in the application of high quality research evidence to inform HR policies and practices. The other thing is, is that we noticed that they aspire to take a, a larger role uh, in leadership discussions around HR factors relevant to business outcomes, and that they often have a higher interest than leadership to facilitate diversity and inclusivity in their, in their workplaces. And in uh, some cases, HR professionals are part of the C-suite, are those uh, on the leadership team, but that's not uh, uh, generally um, uh, the practice. Next slide, please. Uh, we asked um, uh, uh, HR professionals to tell us about what they do in uh, recruiting practices for recruiting people with disabilities. And we were delighted that um, uh, some of them uh, um, identified really some best practices and some innovative ideas. So multiple recruitment formats, the use of recruiters to assess prospective interviewees to better understand what their needs are before uh, prior to um, meeting with a hiring manager. Internships, um, and I'll talk a little bit about that uh, later. Uh, but the other was having a people with disability hotline, a people with disability ambassador, uh, the, uh, the need to have more flexible job descriptions, um, and uh, engagement of community organizations such as CCRW, et cetera, um, uh, and uh, uh, realize around uh, professional uh, or professional support around uh, recruitment services uh, by these nonprofit organizations. Um, the other that was interesting was uh, the use of um, um, union employee collaboration or labor management uh, collaboration around uh, discussion 
around uh, ways that uh, the organization could improve or enhance recruitment uh, and retention of people with disabilities. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, we also looked at uh, some of the uh, other literature um, around what supports recruitment, uh, just to see, to contrast it against what we were uh, gaining uh, information from, from the HR professionals. And we asked, uh, we also asked um, uh, the HR professionals around um, how important certain elements were uh, in terms of um, making changes to recruitment and retention. And, and the first one was demonstrable commitment from leadership. The other is uh, government support to employers uh, in, in regards to internship programs, uh, as well as credible information resources, but also employer recognition programs. And we saw uh, some of those ideas also represented in the disability strategy that Maureen Hahn and uh, Emil Tampa talked about. Uh, it, once again, the, cred the need for credible and reliable sources of information and awareness training to share best practice. The engagement of community organizations and other networks for recruitment and support, um, uh, which is something common that we found as well. And uh, as well that where workplaces, uh, where there are managers that have personal experiences with disabilities, are the most accommodating towards recruiting people with disabilities. Uh, if we go to the next slide. In terms of barriers to accommodation, um, uh, when we asked HR professionals, the, the top one was the lack of supervisor knowledge of which accommodation to make, uh, the lack of related experiences, um, attitudes and stereotypes, um, uh, concerns around costs of accommodation, uh, the lack of uh, requisite skills or training, uh, concerns about cost of supervision or additional costs, and costs of training. Um, uh, now that was interesting because we also looked at some research that showed that actually cost was um, minimal for accommodation in the majority of accommodation requirements. And in fact, when you compare um, the cost of accommodation for people without disabilities and people with disabilities, uh, you'll see that uh, they're uh, fairly comparable for the majority of cases. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, other barriers included um, unclear medical information on limitations. Um, and this was, um, the notion of difficulty differentiating functional limitations versus individual preferences. Uh, and that becomes a bit more interesting to uh, think about in terms of disclosure. And I'm glad that uh, Monique uh, uh, will be speaking about that um, later. Um, lack of leadership uh, education, lack of general principles, policies and practices within an organization, depending on the size of the organization. Uh, lack of communication. Sometimes collective agreements can be uh, problematic in that they may not provide um, sufficient flexibility for accommodation, but also uh, fear of cascading effects uh, may be also an issue. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the other thing that we learned and, and uh, that was recognized in the work that uh, Melissa uh, had um, talked about from their survey uh, was that uh, generally HR professionals have a little bit more experience with physical and chronic illness uh, conditions uh, and less experience uh, with mental health conditions. And so that's an area that uh, there needs to be both more research as well as more education and awareness work going on. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, next, sorry. So uh, let's talk about enabling um, job retention uh, strategies. Uh, and these came from um, uh, the perspectives of HR professionals who responded to the survey. Uh, so one was of course, making physical environments more accessible. Uh, but then on the education and training and support is uh, both recognizing HR training, 
training of recruiters and managers, training for supervisors on disability related topics, as well as having uh, more opportunity for education and online and, and classroom education uh, on these topic areas. I'm just going to uh, highlight a few of these because of the time. Uh, but at the end of the presentation, I've uh, provided a link for the full report for those that are interested. Um, uh, also looking at uh, 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 where some have used uh, both internal or external job, job coach uh, training, um, as well as um, uh, uh, some uh, employers having disability coordinators, as well as fostering conversations on mental health. Uh, policies and practices, uh, of course, uh, also uh, were referred to in related to um, having extended health benefits, having appropriate um, short-term disability, long-term disability uh, insurance uh, coverage, uh, flexible hours, and, and being able to be more uh, lenient uh, uh, around benefits. Uh, and then the other one that I'll mention is really the temporary uh, and also permanent cross department accommodation and the, uh, the, um, the need to have uh, that level of flexibility uh, within uh, workplaces. Uh, next slide, please. And now some of the interesting um, correlations I'm gonna talk to you about, because I thought that these are, were um, to, to us were fairly exciting. Uh, and uh, what we found was that organizations that had high team functioning and organization support, where employees felt valued and where leadership uses more comprehensive and accountable approaches to facilitating, uh, facilitating organizational change, they also tended to have stronger policies and practices conducive to recruitment and retention of people with physical and mental disabilities. Uh, and I think that this is uh, uh, interesting to look at sort of what are the prerequisites or some of the things that were in place aside from uh, the training component on disability confidence. If we go to the next slide. Um, we also found that organizations that had formal disability management programs uh, tended to invest more in training for HR professionals as well as managers. They tended to have more comprehensive change approaches, and uh, it was generally easier uh, making accommodation changes uh, within the workplace as well. And then if we go to the next slide. Um, so here uh, we see that there are multiple factors and we began doing a little bit of modeling because uh, of time I won't have time to go through all of the elements of it, but um, our research is suggesting that work environments um, uh, uh, where employees are valued and engaged and supportive and already have effective team work, communication, innovation, respectful are all elements that, that um, assist the workplace for all employees, people with disabilities and people without disabilities, uh, as well as have those organizations that have competencies around leadership development, HR strategy, have uh, strong uh, data analytics uh, in an integrated fashion. And I was really pleased to talk to hear Emil uh, talk about the data analytics and the need for integrated data analytics. Uh, and um, uh, that talk about mental health, physical health and foundations are foundations for diversity and inclusion. And some of the HR metrics are job satisfaction, turnover, work absence, productivity and claims uh, are all elements that uh, we think should be part of the integrated uh, activity. And I think the next slide is the last slide. And uh, here's uh, the contact information. I'd really like to thank Arla who uh, participated uh, a lot in the development of this presentation. Uh, thank you very much. 
Thank you so much, Dr. White. Uh, we certainly value your insight into work wellness, prevention of work disability, and participatory approaches to knowledge uh, mobilization. So thank you. We can now take a few questions for Dr. Stockdale and Dr. White. Melissa, I'll hand it over to you. Thanks to, very uh, much, to David, and thank facilitate. you, Cam Thanks. and Mark. It's fantastic to hear about the research that you're doing and some of the data that you're collecting. It's so important for uh, for folks to, to know. Um, I welcome people to uh, throw some questions into the Q&A. I don't have any at the moment other than a request for the technical link. Um, what I do have as a question, though, is whether or not you will be considering resending the survey out to capture how or if things have changed from the COVID context perspective. Uh, well, I'll let Cam, uh, as I'm now retired, and right. <laughs> I was the former CEO and president that Cam had uh, mentioned at the beginning, uh, and I'm thoroughly delighted for Cam to take on that role. Um, but it may be something that they're interested in doing. Okay. You know, I think that one of the things that COVID has done from our perspective, the way that we've approached it is, uh, you know, it's, a, it's been disruptive in all of our lives. And, you know, the, the research that we are uh, following up on is the impact of sort of those, um, <clears throat> how do I say this? those disruptive elements of our life and the impact. So uh, I don't know about this particular survey and, and whether or not we're going to apply for funding uh, to redo the survey, but you know, we have just brought on a new scientific director in the organization fairly recently. And a lot of the type of work um, that Mark has done in the past, um, you know, we are going to be sort of following up on a number of the research projects and we're looking at um, what Mark has uncovered in this one and look for other areas where we can uh, follow past the follow I guess. Maybe that doesn't answer your question specifically, but. Uh, um. I think that the, uh, the other thing that I should just say is, is that with uh, Melissa is that um, the survey isn't really COVID dependent in that uh, many of the questions were really looking at what their knowledge, uh, 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 their knowledge and policies and practices are. Now, of course, things are going to change. And so, um, uh, uh, and those changes are going to take a little while to settle. Um, uh, so I think that um, replicating this type of work may be useful five or 10 years from, uh, you know, uh, five years or 10 years from now to see uh, differences, uh, po possibly uh, uh, looking at it um, on how well we're doing in the terms of the di disability uh, strategy uh, that um, uh, Maureen and uh, Emil have discussed. Uh, but it just gives us one, one opportunity to look at uh, perspectives of current knowledge base and pro practices. And this was with public and private uh, sector employees employers. Okay. All right. I do have one question in the chat box at this point, which is, um, was the survey cross Canada or in BC? And how many HR employees completed it? Uh, okay, so in the, the first uh, slide, um, uh, so uh, the majority of HR professionals were from Alberta, and okay. British Columbia. Uh, but that it included uh, Northwest Territories, uh, Yukon, uh, Nunavut. Uh, we did have some from Manitoba and Saskatchewan. Uh, but uh, that on the organizational readiness survey, um, uh, COVID hit just as we were um, uh, branching out because we were also had interest on the East Coast um, from HR professional associations. Um, but um, at that point, everyone, uh, as soon as, uh, as, soon as uh, COVID hit and uh, massive changes had to occur, HR professionals became pretty busy. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I've got one uh, more so, question. So uh, in terms of numbers, hmm. uh, I believe there was around uh, 434 HR professionals uh, in terms of responders. Uh, we had uh, slightly over 500, I think. If, uh, you'd have to go back to that for uh, to the to the slide set to see it. Okay. 
Okay. So the last question I've got is, can you recommend any resources for HR professionals to begin to look at so they can develop their disability process guidelines? Uh, well, I think um, uh, both, uh, both Workplace Wellness has uh, webinars um, and uh, that involve uh, lots of partners uh, that, are, uh, that are represented here as well. Uh, CCRW. Uh, so there's um, so the, um, the there's also a fabulous uh, working group on uh, cancer and return to work. Uh, so there are more and more resources um, being developed that are evidence informed resources. Uh, I know that we've had um, a huge response with the Work Wellness uh, Institute webinar series. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and there are lists of resources, uh, I believe, at the Work Wellness uh, Institute website. Uh, but also, I, I suggest people visit the Realize site, uh, CCRW, uh, as well. Uh, and the uh, other partners also are involved in developing evidence-informed resources. Uh, the technical um, report does list resources. And um, Melissa, okay. I'm just wondering if you wouldn't mind copying that link and throwing it into the chat. Sure. Um, as I... that might be helpful to people um, to have a look at sooner than later. I will do that. Absolutely. Thanks so much to you both. It was uh, excellent to hear from you. And David, it's all yours. Great. Thanks, Melissa. Thanks, everyone.